Some small businessmen in Newark are saying that the city is a difficult place in which to operate a successful business. Their problem is not competition, but crime and the inability to control it. Frank Manet has operated a clothing store in North Newark for 33 years. In an interview last January, Manet told New Jersey Nightly News that crime has gotten out of hand. As a matter of way of life, I carry a 38 on my person. It's a licensed gun, and I have a permit for it. I carry it on me every day. My family have been pressuring me to move out. They no longer want me to stay here. They say it's only a matter of time before I get it. Since that interview, Manet has had about 10 burglaries in his store. He says the crime problem angered and distressed him so much that one morning in September on his way to work, he suffered a severe heart attack. Now he is resting at home and plans to sell out his inventory and close down the business. To me, this is like me being shot and being crippled. There's, my whole way of life has changed now. I cannot do what I had done in the past. I'm not capable of doing it. I don't know if I'll ever be capable of doing a gainful day's work again. Newark police tried to protect the more than 330,000 people who live in the city. Last year, over 42,000 serious crimes were reported. The police force works in four shifts, with only about 400 officers on duty at any one time. Police Director Hubert Williams says citizens should do more to fight crime. Why are so many homes and businesses broken into? People don't take simple precautions to prevent crime. What they do is simply come to the police and say, why don't you prevent the crime from occurring? We must begin to accept responsibility for what's happening in our lives. The institutions of American government can no longer do that. I don't think they could ever do it in the first place. Frank Manet says that for the last seven years, he has been trying to beat the criminals. I've taken every precaution that I could possibly take. I put vibrators in the place. I put uh, silent alarms. I could hold up buttons. Everything is alarmed like Fort Knox. Insurance has covered the majority of his losses, but that doesn't stop the burglars from coming in through the ceiling, through the windows, through the back doors, through the cellar. Tommy Menacucci, who works in the store, describes one recent burglary. They came into the roof. They jumped from a corner apartment, uh, one roof to the other, until they came to this roof. And then they broke through the roof and they come through the hallway down below, right through here. And they uh, took whatever they wanted, had a good time, cleaned us out. Manet says he notifies the police each time his store is broken into. But he says sometimes the police don't come for hours after the crime, and they offer little help. This is all I got. If you have any clothes, call us up. I did it one time. I called them up. I says, well, there's a person across the street to sort the, sort the whole crime committed. And the response was, well, why don't you go across the street and, uh, and question them? Am I the detective? Thanksgiving night, the day after our interview with Frank Manet, a two-alarm fire destroyed his clothing store. Fire officials don't know yet what caused the fire, but they are planning an investigation. Crime affects everyone in Newark. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, or Hispanic. Manor Quality Cleaners has four Newark locations. All of them have been robbed repeatedly. Owner Fred Stalk says after eight years in the business, he's fed up with crime. Originally, we never had any problems. If you look around, you notice that I have uh, 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 closed myself in. I've had to use uh, bulletproof glass. I've had to, to uh, e extend the screen. In all of my three locations, uh, you'll find the same situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, as a matter of record, uh, last month I was held up twice, and so far, so far, I was held up as recently as last Friday. Pauline Wooten, who works at the cleaners, recalls another robbery several years ago. I heard the rustling of the plastic bags, and when I turned around, there was a young man standing behind me, and um, he uh, announced that it was a holdup, and being a woman, I screamed first, and he hit me and knocked me uh, in this beam behind me, and he proceeded to kick me in my chest and uh, we didn't have the enclosure over the top like we have now and he tried to open uh, this cash register which he could not do and um, he again kicked me and like stomped me in my chest area and he jumped over the petition and ran. Fred Stalk says he can't count the cost of crime to his business. It has grown to the point where he has two people doing one job to reduce the possibility of a holdup. 
He thinks more foot patrolmen would deter robberies during business hours. In view of the fact that these recent hold-ups, uh, it, has, it has forced me to really give some careful consideration to at least <clears throat> closing down two of my locations, which I hate to do. Police Director Williams says crime is a nationwide problem, and to those businessmen who say that they are moving out of the city, Williams says leaving Newark won't leave crime behind. I would ask him, what planet is he going to go to? How is he going to escape the reality by leaving the cities, which is a primary marketplace for most major products? What he's got to do is to take steps to protect his business. He's got to put in appropriate devices. He's got to develop habits for his employees that will not expose them to criminal attack. And our department is ready, willing, and able to provide support and assistance in this direction. Whether or not crime is worse somewhere else is little consolation for crime victims in Newark. The city's future may depend on how well its officials and citizens cooperate in fighting crime. Earlier in the year, it was widely reported that the U.S. Justice Department had begun an investigation into Newark Mayor Kenneth Gibson's personal finances. At that time, we told you how the federal government was looking for possible tax and election law violations. But New Jersey Nightly News has learned exclusively that the Gibson tax investigation is only one of a number of federal probes underway in Newark. Tonight, we repeat the first of a two-part series of reports on those investigations. Called Newark, the feds take a closer look. The series was prepared by producer Bill Einrenhofer and reporter Phelps Hawkins. This year alone, the city of Newark received more than $20 million in CETA job training grants from the federal government. The city, in turn, hired a number of subcontractors to run training programs and provide other services. It is these subcontractors who oversee the day-to-day -day operation of many CETA programs, and they are paid a fee for each student they enroll. Federal regulations require that all CETA contracts be open to competitive bidding. But in Newark, there hasn't been a great deal of competition. Millions of dollars in contracts have been awarded to companies that were often the only bidders. Federal authorities were puzzled. It was as if some of the contracts had been designed with a specific contractor already in mind. The bidding process, only a formality. Why, they wondered, wasn't there more competition in this potentially lucrative field? One person who did try to compete is Tony Harris. She's the director of the Architects Community Design Center, a nonprofit group that gives technical assistance to neighborhood organizations. There are about 60 of these centers nationwide, helping community groups revitalize older cities. Harris is herself president of a national design center organization, but she told producer Bill Einrenhofer that this didn't seem to matter when she tried to get help from Newark CETA. We've put together proposals that would not only train human beings and, and create a, a human market, a marketable, uh, 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 employable sector of this community, this Newark community, but the work that we do, the, service, the services we deliver, accrue benefits to the city in that we are recycling their old buildings and, and developing their vacant lots and their burned out buildings into something that is usable, something that is practical and of value to the city. Uh, so we have done training proposals and been rejected. We have done uh, proposals for give us manpower to do programs and been rejected. The man Tony Harris sent the proposals to is Harry Wheeler. Wheeler has been part of the Gibson administration since 1970. He's the director of the Mayor's Office of Employment and Training, the agency responsible for running Newark's massive CETA program. New Jersey Nightly News has learned that the Justice Department has subpoenaed Harry Wheeler to answer questions about the process the city has used to award CETA contracts. In addition, Wheeler's personal financial records, including his canceled checks, have been subpoenaed. Members of Harry Wheeler's staff have also been questioned. I have no right to have any fear whatsoever. And uh, the Gibson administration invites investigations if people feel that they need to do that. But we're accountable. And that is the theme of the Gibson administration, accountability. I also maintain that the most difficult money to manage in our entire managerial-monetary system is federal dollars. 
because you have all kinds of constraints and we spend an inordinate amount of time around eligibility around making sure that the it was a monitoring process and most important making sure that there is proper accountability in part the justice department was acting on a letter sent to secretary of labor ray marshall earlier this year signed by james walker the executive director of the nonprofit new jersey construction trades corporation the letter charged that harry wheeler and other gibson administration officials have ignored Labor Department regulations requiring competitive bidding before any CETA contracts can be awarded. In the letter, Walker claimed, We have in our possession the names of specific contractors who have been awarded contracts by Mr. Wheeler's office, which have not followed the bid procedure outlined by the Department of Labor. Walker continued, Community-based organizations are not being involved in the bid process as required by law. The feeling prevails that only those organizations or firms who have made political contributions receive favorable consideration. For seven years, the New Jersey Construction Trades Training Corporation was funded by the state. During that period, it successfully trained more than 1,000 minority construction workers, taking the hardcore unemployed and giving them a valuable trade. State budget cutbacks forced the corporation to turn to Newark for help. The city did provide some funding. But since James Walker's letter last June to the federal authorities, Newark has refused to renew the funding for the center, claiming the project can't meet the city's strict contractual standards. The training center is closed now, the building it once occupied for sale. The FBI was very interested in what James Walker had to say. So much so, they advised him not to talk with reporters about the case. The FBI has also taken an interest in some of the organizations that did receive CETA contracts. 972 Broad Street in Newark is the home of Workworld Incorporated. Since October 1978, Workworld has received over $320,000 in CETA contracts from the city of Newark. They were the firm's chief source of income. Workworld is located in the same office as an organization known as the Council for Airport Opportunity. Airlines that use New York area airports, as well as the Port Authority, contribute to the council, which helps minority workers find employment in the airline industry. Harry Wheeler is chairman of the executive committee of the Council for Airport Opportunity. His sister, Mary Willis, runs the council's Newark office. Officially, Mrs. Willis is only an advisor to Workworld. But people familiar with WorkWorld's operations say she's involved in running that office, too. WorkWorld seems to have a special relationship with Harry Wheeler. It was first created at the suggestion of the Council for Airport Opportunity, an organization Harry Wheeler heads. The Council for Airport Opportunity and WorkWorld share the same rented office. But for a time, WorkWorld didn't pay any rent. The council paid the whole bill. Earlier this year, Wheeler had his sister, Mary Willis, and Mary Darden, the project coordinator at WorkWorld, spend a month working at Newark's CETA headquarters, where they taught city employees how to evaluate CETA subcontractors. Now, in an ironic turn of events, the students are going to grade the teachers, as city CETA monitors evaluate the job performance of WorkWorld. WorkWorld's incorporation papers filed with the state in 1977 contain a list of trustees for the company. One of the names on the list is Loretta Kroom. Her job is to monitor the performance of CETA subcontractors. Loretta Kroom is a city employee. She works for Harry Wheeler. What Ms. Kroom does with her life in terms of how she perceives her responsibility to the community after she has completed her daily assignments here is a real, no real concern to me. I don't have any problems with that. This rather nondescript building is the headquarters of Worldwide Educational Services, another firm that has had extensive dealings with Newark's CETA program. Since 1976, Newark has awarded Worldwide $1.1 million in CETA contracts. Worldwide occupies a unique position in Newark's overall CETA program. Besides having offices in Newark's East Ward, Worldwide was the only CETA subcontractor to have had offices in the city's own CETA building just down the street from Newark City Hall. Worldwide is also the only CETA subcontractor to have hired the wife of a Newark City Councilman. 
Henry Martinez represents Newark's East Ward on the City Council. Up until last year, Martinez's late wife Elizabeth was on the payroll of Worldwide Educational Services, where she held the title of community worker. In 1978, Henry Martinez received a $500 campaign contribution from Worldwide Educational Services, plus a separate $200 donation from the company's president. The Newark City Council votes on all CETA contracts. Councilman Martinez apparently saw no conflict of interest in voting to award contracts to a firm that employed his wife. In fact, at least six times it was Martinez who recommended that the council accept Worldwide's bids to provide various CETA training services. Yes, I did make the move on several occasions, not on all of the occasions. And I did it because it was in the best interest of the East Ward. The Worldwide Educational Service provided a great opportunity for the residents of the East Ward for educational opportunities and employment opportunities, something that we have never had before in the East Ward. Councilman Martinez's actions are not illegal, since the Newark City Council has never formally adopted a code of ethics. Edward Quinn is the president of Worldwide Educational Services. In a telephone interview with producer Bill Einrenhofer, Mr. Quinn told us, all our records have been subpoenaed. It's not the only county or city it's happened in. They, the federal investigators, have gone to the bank and they're looking, they tell me, for the fact we paid off people in Newark to get contracts. That is simply not the case, now or ever. Mr. Quinn declined to be interviewed on camera on the advice of his attorney. The East Ward Community Center is another CETA subcontractor that has had a relationship with Henry Martinez. The treasurer of Martinez's 1974 and 1978 campaigns and the former East Ward Democratic chairman have both served on the center's board of directors. Over the past three years, the East Ward Center has received nearly a quarter of a million dollars in Newark CETA grants, with Councilman Henry Martinez recommending that the council award these contracts. In 1978, Henry Martinez received more than $1,000 in campaign contributions from individuals associated with the East Ward Community Center. But the councilman argues these people never asked him to do any favors, and he's willing to testify to that. I welcome any federal investigation and would help any federal investigation if there is any uh, uh, appearance of wrongdoing on anyone's part. I in no way want this television interview to show that it's going to be hamper the investigation. I'm prepared to go before any grand jury or any U.S. attorney's office to give them whatever facts that I may uh, give them that would improve or help their case. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark, in an effort to understand how Newark's CETA program operates, has requested and received city records dating as far back as 1974. These records include internal memos, fiscal reports, and correspondence. Records from other public and private agencies have also been obtained. Federal authorities are now trying to sort and evaluate all this information, concentrating on contract bidding procedures, and trying to fit this data into the large jigsaw puzzle that the Newark probe has become. Mayor Kenneth Gibson was the original target of this investigation. Initially, federal investigators were only interested in the mayor's personal finances. Later, as questions regarding Gibson's 1974 campaign finances began to surface, the Justice Department and Internal Revenue Service began to actively investigate allegations that Kenneth Gibson diverted thousands of dollars in campaign contributions into a personal bank account. Gibson himself eventually appeared before a federal grand jury that besides possible tax and election law violations was also exploring charges Kenneth Gibson had received thousands of dollars in personal gifts from Newark businessmen. Mayor Kenneth Gibson has denied any wrongdoing. He also declined our invitation to be interviewed for this report. Within the city government, Gibson loyalists are being told that the federal investigation is unjustified. Some city officials have gone so far as to tell city workers that the investigation is part of a racist plot aimed at preventing Kenneth Gibson from running for governor. The federal investigation into Kenneth Gibson's personal finances, as well as the probe into the city CETA program, continue to haunt the Gibson administration. Kenneth Gibson had hoped that these probes would come to a swift conclusion because the uncertainty they generate can only hurt the mayor's gubernatorial campaign. But the investigations continue to drag on with no end in sight. 
and tomorrow night we'll examine the federal probe into yet another city agency the newark redevelopment and housing authority last night we presented part one of our special investigative report newark the feds take a closer look we outline the scope of the current justice department investigation into newark's multi-million dollar CETA program as well as a separate investigation into the personal finances of newark's mayor ken gibson Part two looks at the investigations going on inside the Newark Redevelopment and Housing Authority. And though the report aired earlier this week, we feel it bears repeating tonight. Phelps Hawkins reports. The trial of Robert Notty, the former executive director of the Newark Redevelopment and Housing Authority, was only one aspect of a much larger investigation into Newark's multi-million dollar urban renewal and redevelopment programs. Nottie's acquittal on extortion charges earlier this month was a major setback for the federal government. The acquittal raises serious questions about how vigorously the Justice Department will now pursue the other probes currently underway in the Housing Authority. That's because it was during the Robert Nottie investigation that the Justice Department first began to uncover unexpected information. That information pointed to other possible irregularities within the Newark Housing Authority, irregularities that may have cost taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars. When you mention the Newark Redevelopment and Housing Authority, this is what people usually think of, low-income housing projects like the Scudder Homes in Newark Central Ward. But in recent years, the Housing Authority has branched out into other areas. Over the last decade, the authority has bought more than 1,400 acres of swampland in Newark's East Ward. Paid for by a $50 million federal grant, the polluted, garbage-strewn marsh was first cleared and filled, then sold to developers at bargain basement rates. Called the R121 project, the idea was to attract new industry to Newark, and it has. Manufacturing and distribution firms moving into Newark's Meadowlands have brought with them scores of new jobs, a pleasant change for a city more accustomed to losing industry. But now federal authorities are exploring whether the original purchase price paid by the housing authority for this land was too high, or if lucrative side deals were made which allowed some housing authority officials to make a profit when the land was eventually sold to developers. Investigators have been at work at the Essex County Hall of Records, studying the deeds and mortgage records of property located in the R-121 redevelopment area. At the same time, the Justice Department is probing the award of demolition contracts by the Housing Authority. Investigators believe that at times, multiple contracts have been awarded, with contractors paid two or three times for the same work. Housing Authority demolition records dating back to 1971 have been subpoenaed. So have the records of the City Department of Health and Welfare. Contracts like these, which list buildings the city ordered demolished, the contractor paid to do the work, and the amount of money the city paid. The Justice Department has been studying contracts like these, what the city terms emergency demolition contracts. They're awarded without public bidding because of the urgent nature of the work involved. But the city privately solicited bids for some of these contracts at least a month before they were actually awarded, leading to questions about the city's definition of what constitutes an emergency. Newark City Demolition Unit has also come under scrutiny. Investigators want to find out if city workers actually demolished buildings that private contractors were paid to destroy. And who takes possession of the used brick, copper pipe, and other potentially valuable scrap found on demolition sites? Besides the current Justice Department probe, the Newark Housing Authority has also attracted the attention of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. In the past, HUD has had some questions about some of the Housing Authority's bookkeeping practices. Reports filed by the authority in the mid-1970s show that federal money was paid out for a number of improvements at the Scudder Homes housing project. Roof repairs cost $74,000. Terrazzo tile for the lobbies cost $92,000. $5,000 was spent on water fountains in public areas. But despite these expenditures, the roofs at the project never stopped leaking. 
no new tile was ever installed in the lobbies, and there's not a drinking fountain to be seen. It would appear that the housing authority paid thousands of dollars for goods and services they never received. Authority officials claim that this was simply an old in-house bookkeeping procedure, which allowed contractors to be paid before specific improvement projects were completed. Milton Buck, the current executive director of the housing authority, contends that this system isn't being used anymore. Assuming that that procedure was used in the past, we do not do that now. No contractor will be paid any amount of money for work that's not finished. While housing authority officials insist they have ended any questionable bookkeeping practices, some observers aren't so sure. The latest controversy here at the Scudder Homes involves hardware, bathroom fixtures, and kitchen appliances. The federal government has set aside millions of dollars to help finance improvements here. As each particular project is completed, the housing authority simply charges the federal government for the costs involved. But now the Tenants Association claims that the Housing Authority is artificially inflating those costs. And the tenants are afraid that the federal money will run out before all the needed repairs at the Scudder Homes are completed. Since 1975, the federal government has given the Housing Authority five and a half million dollars in grant money. Money specifically earmarked for improvements at the Scudder Homes. But the Housing Authority had other priorities. So instead of using the money right away, the authority put it in the bank. But while the money collected interest, its value was seriously eroded by inflation. As with all federal grants, the authority was allowed to subtract its own administrative fees from the grant money, fees that ranged as high as 27%, depending on the project involved. By the time actual work began, there was only enough money left to rehabilitate six of Scudder's eight buildings. Of the six buildings being repaired, only five will get new roofs. Oscar Miles is president of the Scudder Homes Tenants Association. We won't be able to do as much deferred maintenance in as many apartments as we would have been able to do. Uh, the money for the modernization of the kitchens and the bathroom, the labor portion, will not go as far as it would have went had they started on time. Because of inflation, wages are higher, materials are higher. At the Housing Authority warehouse in North Newark, the authority has been storing new bathroom fixtures for apartments at the Scudder project. But while the authority paid $447,000 for these fixtures, they now are considering charging the federal government $564,000. The rationale? Due to inflation, the fixtures are worth more, and it costs money to store them at the authority's warehouse. The problem arises in how the cost of storing those materials since 1975 and 76 is going to be paid. Should that uh, come out of uh, the modernization program that purchased the equipment and also pays for the installation, or should it come out of the regular management budget, as we refer to it here, that operates the housing projects. Neither one of those budgets have a surplus of dollars. In fact, point of fact, we are struggling with the management budget right now to balance it for uh, our present year. So what we're looking at is the least painful way to pay unnecessary costs that has built up over the years. The Newark Housing Authority would like to mark up the prices for all the goods it stores in its warehouse, not just the bathroom fixtures. Tenant leaders at the Scudder Homes claim these price increases are an example of how federal money earmarked for modernization projects instead of resulting in actual construction is in fact being used to help finance the Housing Authority administration. Officials at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, when we told them about some of the Housing Authority's accounting practices at the Scudder Homes, were both surprised and confused and they told us they planned to look into the matter. Not surprisingly, the multiple federal investigations now underway in Newark have had an effect on operations at City Hall. We've been told by one senior city official that employee morale is low, and that's understandable. As he told us, how would you like it if every time you needed a file or some other record, you discovered the Justice Department had carted it away? It becomes very difficult just doing business. That's the kind of exasperation that many city officials feel the sort of thing they say off the record. 
They complain that the media and the general public seem to assume that everyone in city government is guilty of some crime, when in fact only a relative handful of people have been indicted, and so far no one has been convicted of a crime. Still, the federal government has initiated several major probes into the Gibson administration. At the very least, investigators must have serious doubts about the way some city departments are run in Newark. It's ironic that this should all be happening within the administration of a man first elected as a reformer. In 1970, with the election of Kenneth Gibson, citizens of Newark hoped to remove the taint of corruption associated with Hugh Adonisio's years in office. But now, once again, there are federal investigations underway at City Hall, and people in Newark are concerned, with many of them wondering out loud, has Newark been unfairly singled out for harassment, or is there a valid reason for the federal government's apparent concern? In Newark, I'm Phelps Hawkins.